like to call to order the Committee of the Whole meeting of Monday, September 17, 2018. Uh, the clerk call the roll, please. Mayor Berman? Here. Trustee Gaffino? Here. Trustee Lowry? Here. Trustee Curtis? Here. Trustee Carroll? Here. Trustee Martinez? Here. Trustee Gately? Here. No audience comments. Uh, trustee comments? Yeah, you know, I'd like to make a comment. I forgot to make it at the last 10 minutes. Um, I just wanted to follow up with you, Mike. I just recently had some work done to my house. I had a new front door installed and some windows. And I, I spoke with you a while back about the permitting requirement for a front door. Um, so just to give you some background, I had to pay like $92 to get my front door permit to have my front door installed. And then nobody even comes out to, to do an inspection to make sure that it's been done properly. So that's one of the things I'd like to take a look at is to see why, why we're requiring a front door permit when there's no follow-up inspection that, I mean, it just doesn't seem like we're really getting any value for the money that residents are spending. Yeah, actually, you can, if you want a permit or if you want an inspection, you can call and make an inspection. Typically, the way it works is we issue the... I don't want a permit for a front door. I, I don't see why we need to put a permit into something that's not changing... Okay. The structure at all. It's not adding or subtracting from anything. It's just popping out a door frame and slapping a new one right back in. So I, I paid $92 and I don't feel I got my money's worth. The second thing is I just got some new windows installed and the permit ended up being 180 something dollars and I was told that it was based on the price of the total project. So can somebody explain to me um, the value added we get, the more we spend, do we get a better inspection? Because I'm not understanding the reasoning behind a, you know, sli a sliding tier of fees. Yeah, some of these are revenue-based uh, permits. You know, for windows, we look for U factors, making sure that they meet a certain energy efficiency uh, that is required by the state of Illinois. I think this is the 2015, 2018 um, energy conservation codes. Um, so it's to verify that, it's to verify and make sure that the contractor is registered so we have, um, we have knowledge of who's doing work in town. Um, but uh, yeah, we do follow up inspections, but they are, um, we do ask that the residents or the permit applicants uh, call and make the request for the inspection. But what, so for example, let's say it costs me 10000 for my house, but somebody out in Tanner trails with a 4,000 square foot house, it's going to cost them twenty or thirty for new windows. So based on that sliding scale, I mean, is there a cap? I just, I just don't understand why it's based on the cost of the project. A permit's a permit. Is anything done differently for somebody that's paying 20000 for windows versus somebody paying 10000 for windows? Yeah, at a, at a cost basis, you are paying more for um, a higher window cost. Yes, it's a sliding right. scale. Why, why is the permit fee different based on the cost of the job? Uh, because that's what I inherited. <laughs> is that something well, we could take a look at? No, certainly. A little bit more equitable? Yeah, we, we, we have actually been looking at our um, permit fees. We, we, do can, we actually have running sheets of how we compare to other communities, which have cost basis, which have fixed base permit fees. Um, we are actually relatively lower in comparison. Um, the cost base fees tend to do, they, they tend to be a little higher um, than most, but our cost base permits are actually fairly low in comparison. So well, we, this is we, a, good, a good thing if we get some of that information and have it at a <coughs> committee of the whole meeting or, yeah. or something that we can Certainly. But I think the big thing is uh, our comparison to uh, our neighbors. What are they charging uh, for the same thing? So, yeah, I guess we're looking into that. And, and I'd like to see if we can just eliminate the whole door permitting thing. I mean, if, if somebody's not even coming out to follow up that the door has even been put in, what, what are we charging people for? Well, we're making sure you buy the right door, I guess. No, nobody came out. Well, the... Permitting process says you're going to, though. Yeah, yeah just for everyone's information, um, once the work is done, you call the village for the inspection. We come out to the inspection thereafter. So. All right. Uh, hmm. Discussion. Item number one. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. Item number one is a tip facade grant. Um, the owner of 2 North Lincoln Way has applied for a TIF facade grant. If you recall, the facade grant program was recently amended to include the demolition of um, certain structures that are, that are deemed to be um, unsightly, also to um, non-conforming single-family homes. These were added to the program in 2017. So the property owner of 2 North Lincoln Way has made an application for the dem demolition of the residents on the property in the detached garage. Um, this would include the demol demolition of both structures. Um, they're requesting $17,342.50 for the total project, the total project being $34,685. 
Um, again, the, the, the house is located at the northwest corner of State and 31. Um, if, if you look in the packet, there are pictures of the home, the detached garage. Uh, there's a list of exterior, interior and exterior improvements that are required by code um, that were decided by our code enforcement officer. Um, they're currently in the process of going through the adjudication for these violations. The, the property owner had deemed that the, the cost of making the improvements to bring the property up to code exceeded what the house is worth. Um, so he is making an application to take advantage of the demolition um, program through the TIFASA grant. So anyone has any questions? This is just for feedback at this time. Yeah, what, what are they going to do with the lot? Are they just going to leave it vacant? Or Correct. What, what are the options? That, can somebody buy it? Is it buildable? Not buildable. Not really buildable as a single family home. It's deficient in regards to lot width and the lot area um, for a single family home in the R2 district. Um, which is which qualifies it for the the demolition program, uh, but 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 it is in a it is in a hard corner. Um, there are opportunities potentially for um, the sky's limit with commercial redevelopment of the area, um, but it is on the corner there. So um, it, 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 and the the end product would be a vacant lot. What uh, do they have any outstanding fines or fees that are payable uh, in the pending? litigation yes they are going through the adjudication process they would be have fines assessed to them regardless if the house is demolished obviously the demolition would bring into code but there would still be fines in place um, for the actual uh, violations of the property maintenance code would the property owner be amenable to deeding the property to the village in exchange and then <laughs> we can keep the property and and take the money out of the TIF district but we would have title to the property in exchange for a release we've had conversations like that he would like to retain the property yeah. uh, that um how's that compared to the house i know it was smaller over there but 34 35 thousand dollars seems huge to take down the house and and i saw the second estimate there is very vague i don't it's Tear down the house 34.5, and there's really no even breakdown of it. So how how does that compare? Seems well, we when we did 24 or excuse me 24 Monroe Street, we our final cost came back for demolition was 24.9, I believe, but the quotes range from 24.9 up to fifty thousand dollars. So I actually gave the the property owner the list of contractors that submitted for 24 Monroe demolition. Um, he had contacted all of them. They're all they, obviously their pricing is based upon availability. So going out and looking for the you know demolition contractors, this is what he had came back with. And it is this is a larger house, yeah, larger yeah. garage. Yeah. And I think of, I think it being removed is a, an improvement in my opinion to the village. No asbestos or anything in it that could come to play part in the demo have that been inspected. Yeah, it's in. It's currently in a state of, of disrepair. Um, it, it's with without the necessary improvements. Obviously, the roof being the, you know the most critical at this point, um, and making sure that the the, the <clears throat> building itself is weather tight. As you can tell by the pictures, that's not the case. Um, so it's it's not really it's not improving at this point. So um, it's either put the money into the building or uh, work towards the yeah, demolition. No, I was just asking if anybody inspected if there was asbestos or anything because otherwise you'll tear the place down, this asbestos just goes all over. Yeah, the, the, <coughs> what the included in here um, as part of that would be um, cost for um, asbestos testing. We didn't, the staff, village staff does not test for that. Okay. Asbestos would usually be on the siding. It looks like it's all like wood siding on um, towel, so probably not at the asbestos. Anything else? I guess you got your, uh, your answer. Thank you. <coughs> Item number two, tattoo. All right. As you, as you all know from 2017, uh, section 5.36 of the village code um, regulates tattoo and body piercing establishments and operators and estab establishment licenses. Um, these codes were adopted in 2001. Um, the state of Illinois actually has the Tattoo and Body Piercing Establishment Registration Act, which it ad adopted in 2007, and also to the Body Art Code, which was adopted in 2008. We currently have three different vendors or operating in town, three registered businesses. And every time we have to go through this uh, license process with these establishments and the operators, um, we, we've, we've run into some conflicts with the state codes, um, primarily in the establishments, the operation requirements, they approach the state of Illinois because they know they have to go through the Department of Public Health. 
And then they come to the village when they find out they have to register, and then they, they find out we have some conflicting um, information and requirements. So what this, what this round of um, amendments would do is actually remove some of the operational requirements that are currently required by the village. Um, they can be seen in the ordinance, which is in the back of the packet. I also included in the packet the state, the body art code, which sets forth operational requirements uh, by the state of Illinois. Uh, the Registration Act also has um, establishment requirements and operational requirements. So with all, these con with all these conflicting codes, we're looking to kind of centralize our codes to still require that an establishment um, register with the village and also too that the, um, an operator would res also register with the village. The, re the operators register initially a one-time registration. The, the establishments themselves um, had to re-register annually. Um, so what we're looking to do is going to consolidate with the state so we eliminate any conflicts. Um, also, too, some of, some of the major differences in what we're looking to do here, one would be allowing um, establishment operators, meaning the business owner or the business manager and or tattoo artist to be 18, where our code requires that they be 21. The state of Illinois um, says you only have to be 18 to actually open an establishment or be a tattoo um, artist, um, but we are at 21. So again, we're looking to go mimic what the state of Illinois requires at this point in time. And also too, with any amendment, we're looking to just open the books, sort of streamline the language itself and um, just remove any conflicts with the code. If you look on the second page, uh, Drendel's office had done a nice job of showing the requirements that the, the state of Illinois has, what we require, and then what are some of the, the actual overlapping um, regulations. So um, we kind of feel that the state has the professionals, the public health professionals, to sort of um, regulate the operations of a tattoo establishment. Well, the village of North Aurora really doesn't. You know, we go out and do these inspections, and you know, the different types of jellies and things like that are to be used. Um, these these are operations that um, should be um, sort of oversaw by the state of Illinois. So, if anyone has any questions on this, I'd be happy to answer them. I was excited to find out they weren't going to do any tongue splitting, though. With regard to the age, do, don't these uh, tattoo parlors have liquor licenses? Don't you have to be 21 to be able to serve alcohol? None of the tattoo parlors have a liquor license as of right now. Well, one was coming in, but I don't know if they actually got their license yet. No. Um, but, but we approved that. We as approved the possibility, right? Correct. And so in that one, it's the class L2 license. And Kevin, if you recall, what is the exact? They have to have it in a separate room, and there's a whole. Yeah, it um, it allows tattoo to be sold. Uh, not tattoo. <laughs> it, it allows Alcohol. liquor to be sold. Um, while uh, displaying um, artwork for right. sale, which could be a temporary thing, but it could be a, a more permanent thing too. We didn't distinguish between the two. Um, it does require that the liquor be sold separately from wherever you know they might pay for services or pro or other products. So it has to be, um, and and if the uh, if the display is in a separate room, the liquor would have to be where the display is. Um, in terms of serving, the state of Illinois actually allows 18-year-olds to serve alcohol. We've always, yeah. um, we've always required 21, but we just changed it for restaurants. So we allow 18-year-olds um, to bring the alcohol to the table at a restaurant, but that would be the only exception in our liquor code right now. Um, so wouldn't that be a problem if, if there's only one person working at a no. tattoo parlor and they're 18? They couldn't. Serve they couldn't alcohol, do it. But someone else could yeah. in the in the you know tattoo establishment. It couldn't be an 18 year old, right? Yeah, both the body are all the state requirements to say that um, you can't you can't even perform a tattoo on anyone that is impaired by drugs or alcohol. So that is actually written in the codes. I'm not sure if that applies to your question. No, I'm just worried about if, there, if a tattoo parlor is open and it only has one employee working and that employee is 18 years old and somebody wants to buy a beer, can't do they it. can't do it. Can't do it. Right. The, the only times that you can sell liquor, though, at the tattoo establishment is when they're having an event under this, uh, this license. So the art event license is uh, for visual art displays and available but in no event shall be sold before, and then it gives you the times. 
Uh, it says, this was designed for when they have, liquor may be sold in conjunction with events uh, conducted within the premises such as art shows, art demonstrations, lectures, and other events as long as the liquor is sold separately from the price of admission or participation. So although, I mean, I, I checked, but the hours of operation are tied in, I believe, directly to those events. Um, I know the tattoo parlor that wanted to have liquor was specifically looking for art shows so to only have it during those art shows. So they're going to have more than one. They're going to have more than one staff person. The last place I want to get to too is where the tattoo artist is drunk, right? Hey, <laughs> oh, you can serve it. Well, I certainly wouldn't stay in business too long. Uh, any other discussion? Entertain a motion to adjourn. Motion to adjourn. Second. All those in favor say aye. 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 Opposed? We're out of here.